ham sandwich. <laughs> you know, while I am not much of a big city guy, I will never be sad about finding myself in the city of New Orleans, which is exactly where I found myself this past August. For one thing, if you're in New Orleans, you're gonna eat good. For another thing, I was there with the man I consider my mentor in outdoor journalism, my dear old friend, Jerry Bethge. Now, hands down, without Jerry Bethge, I would not be here filming hook shots for you guys right now because it was Jerry that hired me at Saltwater Sportsman Magazine way back in 2005. drive through daiquiris. Alcoholic. Only in Louisiana. Here comes this kid. Uh, he was a big ball of sweat. But talk to Joe about, you know, different fishing things and he referred to a fishing rod as a fishing rod and not a fishing pole. And we said, hire him. Now Jerry works for Outdoor Life magazine and through the years we've ended up on some fishing trips together but we have never joined forces for a hook shot. So when Jerry called me and said, hey man, you and I need to go down to Louisiana this summer and do some offshore fishing, I was like, you know what, it is about damn time, you sir are correct. And the plan was to crash at our dear friend Ryan Lambert's Cajun Adventures Lodge. And then we were going to spend two days offshore with Jerry's longtime friend, Captain Peace Marvel. I've uh, fish, fished with him numerous times. Uh, his, his fishing intelligence is off the charts. I have a brother that's 14 years older than I am, and he's had a boat and fish down here since I was about 10 years old. Uh, when I was 10, I saw a tuna jumping for the first time, and I became obsessed with them. My sister's been calling me Tuna Boy since I was 10 years old. I've known Jerry for probably coming up on pretty close to 20 years. I was driving down to Venice one day, and he was holding a sign on the side of the road that said, we'll fish for food. Are you excited, Jerry? It's sword day. Are it is gonna, sword are day. Are you going to get your swordfish today, I'm Jerry? Damn right I am. Now, I've shot episodes down in Venice before, but we had two distinct missions, one of which was to get Jerry's first swordfish in the boat. And as for me, being the adamant can't get enough tuna guy that I am, there are not many places that feed that need better than Venice. So one of the ways to catch tuna down here in Venice is to get behind the shrimp boats. So you roll up on a shrimper, toss the dude a couple of beers, and he gives you sacks of all the cull, all the bycatch. And you pull up next to the shrimp boats, and you chum, and you, and you try to chum up a yellowfin tuna. And truth be told, the bite had been real slow in the weeks prior to us showing up. I knew that worst case scenario, fishing by the shrimp boats, that we could catch some blackfin. Problem is getting through the bonita. Usually the bonita come up first. And every once in a while, you see one of these bigger blackfins come cutting through. So there's all kind of little tricks that we use to pitch the bait differently. We'll use live baits. We'll time the fish. And it did not take him very long to pick one of those black fins out of that chaos. And that would be a tuna. So I'm watching this unfold, right? Black fins kind of cruising the outside, Benito on the inside, stuff blowing up everywhere. And all I could think is, I need to get a popper out there. And while you can try and do your best to pick off a black fin from the perimeter, the Benito are so fast that most of the time, that's what's grabbing that popper. There are also a ton of sharks in the, in the chump select, which, uh, which is both um, infuriating and pretty cool to watch. And have you ever had one of those days when just for whatever cosmic reason, nothing is going your way? Ah, damn mother. <laughs> How many poppers can I lose today, dude? Between my bonita or blackfin getting sharked 
a shark eating the popper or just like oh. random rub offs in the props and underneath the boat. There goes another popper right there. He lost my poppers, he lost his poppers. We stopped at another boat, borrowed some poppers from them, and he lost their poppers. But we hopped a bunch of shrimp boats that morning, never found a yellow fin, and then Pete said, okay, it's time to wrap this up. We pulled a couple of black fins out of this mess. Let's go sword fishing. Now, just a quick bit of backstory, okay? Jerry is absolutely ate up with daytime sword fishing, and he's done it seven times and had yet to land a sword of his very own. I went sword fishing for the first time and we fished at night down here. And it, it was just the drama of the whole thing was so incredibly intriguing. You know, you're fishing in depths that are ridiculous. You know, a thousand feet, 1300 feet. The environment down there where those fish are, are living most of their lives is completely unobservable. It's a very strategic game and he's using six pound steel weights to drop lights and a rigged squid all the way down to the bottom. Now, because you are fishing that deep, even though it might be a 300 pound fish that eats that squid. A violent strike looks like this. You know, if you're not concentrating 100%, um, you're not gonna detect it. And he wanted that fish so bad that his eyes were glued to that rod tip. And we sat around for maybe a half hour, and all of a sudden, dink, dink, dink. And 99 times out of 100, the fish will casually swim to the top. Once we get him hooked up, the angler's just collecting line, collecting line, collecting line, and then they'll, they'll stop, a big one will stop, shake his head and say, oh, wait a second, I, I don't want to be up here. <laughs> you don't know how long the fight's gonna last. You know, it, it could be hours, but you gotta kind of take care of yourself and not overexert yourself and, and not lose focus. Now, in a lot of other places in the country, daytime sword fishermen are using electric reels, but not peace. I would never disrespect the most powerful fish in the ocean by pressing a button and sitting on my butt while he gets reeled to the surface. I don't know how many times he came up and came back down and came up and went back down. Until finally, after about an hour and a half of fighting, we see color and we're like, dude, there it is, man. There is your sword. But that's when I, I think that's where I got the most paranoid and the most nervous because it was coming close to the end and something had to go wrong. I just felt like something was gonna go wrong. I'm so happy to say that we have finally broken the Jerry Swordfish curse. I was as excited about that fish as I was about my first deer. And the fish that Jerry caught is definitely a good fish. I mean, a 100 pound swordfish is nothing to laugh at no matter where you go. And I could not have been happier that after all those tries for Jerry, we got that fish on hook shots. And after the high fives were over and the water slugging was over, I was like, all right, dudes, back to tuna, right? And Peace is like, no, 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 your turn. And I'm just like, ah. Oh. What's up, everybody? I know a lot of you guys don't get the gaff fish, and that really sucks, because it's fun as hell. But if you ever find yourself in the situation where you do get to stick a fish with the hook, here's a couple critical pointers. So first, your hook size has to match your target. Trying to gaff a big fish with a small hook is no good. All it's gonna do is tear out of the fish. Likewise, trying to gaff a small fish with a big gaff it's just gonna bounce off and you're just gonna look like an idiot. Now that you got your perfect gaff size dialed in, let's talk about patience. People get all excited when it comes time for the end game, but you gotta wait for the right shot. Never, I mean never, try taking stabs at a wild hot fish because it's either gonna end in a lost fish or completely ruined filet. Wait for the fish to present itself so you can get a real nice shot at the head. I understand that a heated situation might not always make a headshot possible, but try and get in the habit of hitting that fish forward of the gills to preserve all that precious meat. Now, I'm not gonna lie to you guys, because I never have, right? I thought I made it clear before coming down here that like 
Swordfish for Jerry, tuna for Joey, okay? I really don't need to do this, but there was no getting out of it. I mean, that squid was going back down to the bottom and I was getting fitted for the harness. And I don't think it took another 15 minutes for that rod to go off again. And I'm like, all right, here we go. And then he got harnessed up and he got in the harness and started fighting fish. And I mean, his fish was a hell of a lot bigger than the one I caught. Uh, we fought a 240 for six and a half hours before. I do not understand why anybody thinks this is fun. Joe cried all kind of baby tears. I'm talking, my God. Yes, like a baby, like a, like a small infant baby. Hour and a half in. Now I am literally having a conversation with the guys on the boat. So how's your family? How's everybody doing? For seven minutes, while the 80 wide reel tied to my waist is just dumping and there is nothing that I can do about it. You can't really move him if he does not want to be moved. I mean, if he's still got some juice, you know, go back to the bottom doing 50 miles an hour. And because we're editing here, the two hours and 30 minutes I spent on the rod will never fully translate. But that's how long I fought this fish. And I come right in, I have pretty much all the leader back on the reel. Like we are this close uh. to seeing this swordfish and it completely freaks out. Cuts the line off in the props. In a blink of an eye, it was over. Yep, that's painful. Yeah, so you get back to the dock after um, after day one. And, you know, a couple boats came in with yellow fin tuna. So, as is typical of peace, uh, he hears that other guy's catching tuna and, and he's all about it. And we wanted to catch a yellow fin. So day two mission was kind of yellow fin or bust. And peace is like, we are just gonna keep moving boats and moving boats until we find one. I know that they're here. When we pull up to a shrimp boat and then drift off and we're chumming, we got a bunch of bonito, we have a bunch of the elements, in a heartbeat, those fish will clear out and here will come a 10 or 15, 150 to 200 pound yellow fin. Now, I gotta tell you though, for those first bunch of boats, the black fin were way more fired up than they had been the morning before. First boat, big black fins on. So while the other dudes are basically prepared to not drop a bait unless yellow fin come up, I'm like, dude, screw that. I'm catching these black fins. <laughs> Here they come, and they're just storming the surface. Big blackfin tuna, bigger than any blackfin tuna I've ever seen in Florida. They have giant blackfin tuna down here. And even though I had a miserable day one throwing artificials, I don't know. This time I was just a little bit more dialed, doing a better job of paying attention and keeping that popper away from sharks, waiting for the right shot on a blackfin cruising through the chum. We probably pulled up to 30 shrimp boats, maybe 20 shrimp boats. Every time we pulled up you know, to a shrimp boat, I mean, we were just watching. We ran all over, we dumped a thousand pounds of, of coal in the water, a thousand pounds of chum. And we just never saw our yellow. But you know what? That's the luck of the draw, man. And if there's one thing you can never say about Peace Marvel, it's that we didn't catch him because we didn't try hard enough. I have never fished with anybody who put in as much effort looking for one or two fish in a bleak situation during a slow bite than Peace. Uh, Peace is such a... <sighs> I do this for a living, mainly for the chicks. They say they're going to kill me if if you don't come up with the money soon. There ain't nothing but a main street. It's six o'clock in the goddamn morning. Ain't no other way but to follow.